you're watching the free version of this tutorial. Upgrade to premium for all footage and project and exclusive content. This is exercise eight, rotoscoping basics. And in this exercise, what we're gonna be exploring in more detail are the spline tools and how we can start to mix different layers together and mix splines together. And we're gonna be focused on this clip. So we've got a dog and a motorcycle driven by skeletons, of course. The first thing I want to look at are the different types of splines that we can create here. Up till now, we've exclusively used the X spline. And let's draw an X spline up here so we can see that. And I'm going to right click to close it. And let's just zoom in here. Now, X splines are made up of a control point and a control handle. And the simplicity of these make them perfect for doing organic roto work because we only really have to focus on two things. We have to focus on where our point is positioned and how tense or loose the point is moving between these two other points to the left and right. And the same over here, so we can just loosen or sharpen that edge right up there. Let's turn off the transform tool for a second again, just so we've got a bit more focus on what the shape is doing. And as we've seen before, if we want to make changes across all of the points in the spline, we can just right click on the control handle and that will let us loosen or tighten those control points. If at any time we decide we need uh, an extra control point in the middle of these, then we can just go up to our toolbar at the top and choose the insert point arrow. Then if we come down, we can now insert another point wherever we click. And you'll see the cursor changes as soon as we go over the spine, meaning that I can insert a point at that area. And when I wanna go back, and just go to the black arrow. Now, sometimes we want to be selecting multiple points simultaneously. And with the default arrow, we can just select a little marquee let go and it will select all of the points within our marquee. But let's just have a look up at the toolbar again. And if I click and hold on our pick tool, you can see we have a drop down menu that pops up whether we want to do a marquee selection or a lasso selection. And with the lasso selection chosen, instead of doing a marquee as we had previously, I now have a lasso tool. So I can come in and make some slightly more complicated little shapes to really choose only the points that I want to choose. And wherever you see that little drop down corner, that just means that we do have some other selections that we can make with that particular tool. Cool, let's put that to one side. In fact, no, let's not even put that to one side for a second. Let's just delete that, because we're not gonna use that at all. And we're gonna come back up now, and we're gonna have a look at the other type of spline that we can create, which is a Bezier spline. So I click on the B for the Bezier, and unsurprisingly, what this creates is a spline with Bezier handles instead. Now, Bezier handles, let's just uh, come down to this one down here. All of our points and a Bezier spline consist of three points that we can change. We have the control point, just as we did with the X spline, but we have two handles instead, one on the left and one on the right. And if we hold down the control key or command key on Mac, we can break those handles and make some weird and wonderful shapes with them. And if I let go of control and then just choose the other handle, or either handle I should say, we'll go back to controlling both of them. Let's get rid of this and show you how we might work with the Bezier tool in practice. Because whereas I'd use the X spline when I'm doing my organic roto, so for Rotoring things like uh, people or animals, or in fact anything that sort of uh, starts moving around and gets a little bit squishy. Sometimes for more static, complex shapes or architectural shapes, then the Bezier spline is the one to choose. And the reason for that is that we have a lot more direct control over the shape of the spline and we get more changeable shapes going with the Bezier tool. So if I click and drag, I can set the direction and the length of the next bit of the curve and then I'll follow this handlebar around, click on this one here, and again, click and drag, and I can carry my curve along here. And the same there, I can move the curve over on here, and if I let go 
and hold down my control key, I can change the direction of the curve before I select the next point. And come down here, and maybe we'll try and do this bit here. So again, just changing the direction and the magnitude of the curve is just a, a case of making this longer or shorter. And then pushing that in there. And if I want to change that, to go back up here. Well, that's what I do. There we go. So cool. And let's just have these two edges pointing in the right direction. Before I right click, I can right click anywhere and that will close the shape off for me. So we can see here, I've got a spline with some non-uniform curves and some sharp edges and things going up and back and around. And this sort of shape is easier to do with fewer points with the Bezier spline. And when we're doing rotoscoping, we always want to keep things as simple as possible, especially if we're animating them. So the fewest number of points we can use, the better. And that's one of the big reasons why X splines are preferable for the organic roto, because for each point, you've only got to worry about two items, the control point and the control handle. Where's the Bezier spline? You've got to worry about three things. You've got to worry about the control point and two control handles. So that's 50% more things to worry about with the Bezier spline. So it's a lot easier to start getting lost and uh, chasing your tail when working with complex rotos and a Bezier spine. And because we're doing this for rotoscoping, we're going to be wanting to use these as masks later on. So there's got to be a better way of seeing what's going on here without having a big outline of the spline and all of these control points all over the shop. Well, luckily there is. If we come up to the top of the viewer here, we had some buttons that we didn't look at in exercise one. And we can turn the RGB channel on and off. We can turn the alpha on and off as well. If we come to the third one, we click on this one. We can also see our layer mats. So this is the filled spline that we've got. And the eagle eyed of you will notice that there's another little triangle in the corner that makes this square and circle look like some sort of strange ice cream or kebab. But that's just saying we've got a drop down menu we can look for. So we can see all mats, selected mats, or selected track mats. So if we're working with multiple layers and multiple mats, we'd have all mats turned on just to see how everything's working as a whole. But if you only wanted to see one, or if you only have one, then selected mats is absolutely fine. You can see if I turn on all mats here, even if I don't have the layer selected, it's gonna show me the layer mask. With selected mats turned on, if I don't have this layer selected, it's not gonna be showing me that. Track mats we're gonna to come to in a later exercise. So don't worry about that right now. And we've got a couple of little choices about how we see this layer mat. And if you have a look at the paint can next to us, if I turn off my paint can, so this just shows us a cutout of the original image. If we have the paint can turned on, it colorizes that over the top of the original image. And we can change the opacity of this. At the moment set to 0.5, we can change the opacity just by scrubbing that down. And what if you don't like the color? Well, if you don't like the color of the fill or the spline, then let's come over to the layer controls and we can change both of these. So I can click on my fill here and change this to a color that I can see even better. Maybe let's make that a blue. Looks lovely. And let's come over to the spline and change that into a green. Yeah, let's change it into a green. Nice light green. Beautiful. Making our way along here now, we can turn on and off all overlays with this enable all overlays. And this is really useful, not just when we're creating lots of masks, but also when we're testing out the inserts as well. What this does is turns off all overlays, apart from our layer mats and our inserts. Any of the splines, any of the surface, the grid, all of that disappears. And we can use the tilde key to do that as a keyboard shortcut. But if we want to selectively turn some of that stuff on and off, we can do that with these here. So we've got the outlines, we can turn on and off here. We've also got the little dots so we can see outlines just for the selected layer. So when our layer is not selected, those outlines disappear. Turn that back on and select that layer one more time. And we can also do that for the control points as well. We turn off the spline tangents, that takes away the handles for us. Good stuff. Okay, I'm going to rename this one uh, Motorcycle Bezier. There we go. And while I'm here, I might as well just track this through. 
So let's check out the tracking parameters. I might as well leave all of these at default and just track forwards. Turn off the overlays while we're here so we can have a little look. Make sure that's all working all right. Yep, looking fine. So let's turn our focus now to the dog, shall we? I'll turn off processing and, in fact, visibility as well on the motorcycle for the time being. And let's come and have a look at our dog. Now we can see that the dog isn't moving too much, but the camera's moving a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a track around the, the bit of the dog that doesn't really move at all, which is his body. And then I'm going to come in and do another shape that's going to be for his head that is moving a bit more. And the reason for that is I want to simplify this shape as much as possible. Now, if there was lots of stuff that was moving around, so if the legs were moving all separately, then I would probably go in and try and get shapes for all of these legs as well. But luckily, the dog is on guard duty and not running after people. So let's come in and make a new X spline. And oh, I can't see my X spline for one good reason. And that reason is I forgot to turn on my overlays again. Turn those back on and trash this layer and start afresh. Here we go. So, yeah, that's looking a bit better. Now I can actually see what's going on. Now I'm not going to try to make this too perfect from the, from the get-go because this is just going to be my tracking layer. I don't have to worry too much about anything else. And I'm not even going to worry about smoothing any of this stuff either. Let's, uh, let's turn off the layer mats for a moment and turn off the transform tool as well. And let's track this one through now. So we'll look at the tracking parameters, leave all this stuff at default, unless we know that's not going to work. And I'm not going to have shear turned on. I'm just going to go translation, scale and rotation. He's not really moving all that much. So all we're trying to take out is the movement of the camera. And that's fine. I'm just going to track that forwards. I've left large motion on because even though the dog's not moving, the camera is. So there is still some movement and some motion within the screen. There we go. And let's just rename this layer to dog body. I'm going to do dog body M as well, because I know that's going to be a mask. And one of my little things is I put M at the end of mask layers and T at the end of track layers. I think that just helps me with a bit of housekeeping to figure out what's what. So now we've got our track going on. We want to get this rotoscope looking a little bit sharper, a little bit neater. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. The first way is to come in and change the stuff that we've got on the layer that we've just tracked. Because as I said before, we tracked, I didn't really spend all that much time looking in here and getting all the, uh, the details right. So at the moment, if I zoom in a little bit more, we're cutting off loads of his hind leg there, cutting off some of his tail and all that. It's, it's generally not a good enough shape. So if I start coming in and changing all this and smoothing all this out, what's going to happen? Yeah, that's right. It's going to start adding keyframes for me. Do I want to add keyframes to this? No, not really, because the problems I've got go across the entire image. So what I could do is I could just go back and do all my work on the first keyframe. Or we can do something else. Before we do that, we need to get rid of the keyframe we've already added. And the way we can do that is by coming down to our keys here and hit delete keyframe at current position. Now, sometimes, even though we've got a keyframe on here, this minus keyframe is grayed out. Guess what we have to do? Little trick for you, hit the plus key and then immediately hit the minus key and that will get rid of your keyframe. Nice and simple, no worries. Yeah, what we're gonna do if we're gonna sharpen up this across the entire range is we're gonna use our old friend, the Uber key. So remember, everything we do with the Uber key turned on affects everything across the entire range. So I'm just going to come in and quickly just use this just to get a bit more of a tighter track. It's nice and soft. If I need to add any more points, well, we know how to do that. We just go up to the top, go to our insert point tool, and we can do that. Just make sure we go back to the pick tool afterwards.
Lovely. And then once that's done, before we do anything else, turn off the Uber key. Just get used to having that key off unless you're uh, really wanting to use it. And let's play that back. Okay, it's, it's looking okay, but it's difficult to see exactly what's going on because the viewer keeps moving around all over the place. So think back to what we did when we were looking at stabilization. And if I come up to the top of the viewer and click on the quick stabilize, there we go. That just stabilize out the viewer for me so I can see whether I do need to keyframe anything here, whether there is any movement, maybe he's breathing. So I have to keyframe something up there, but no, not really. He's looking pretty still. Okay, so that's the body done. And now we need to do the head. And I know what you're thinking. We've seen the ad spline tool in a previous exercise. So why don't we just grab this one and add it on to our main body? Look at that. That's that's gonna look that's gonna look great. Well, yeah, it's not really. And the reason for that is that when multiple splines are available on a single layer, what's gonna happen is at any point of overlap those splines are going to cut each other out. Let's have a little look at that with a layer mat turned on. Yeah. So if we like having our cutout dog without a, uh, without a mouth, then this is going to work out absolutely perfectly. If we don't, then we're going to have to do things in a slightly different way. Let's just uh, right click on these points and you can do lots of different stuff with the, the points. You can, you can deactivate them, activate them again, turn them smoother, corner, all that sort of fun stuff. And with a selection, we can select all in spline here. This will take all of my head, and I'm just going to delete that. And selecting all in spline is a lot easier to do, especially when you have overlapping uh, splines and lots of control points that are quite close to each other that can get a little bit fiddly. So just select all in spline, get rid of it. Great, job done. Okay, well, let's turn off processing on our dog body and make a new X spline layer. And this time I'm going to take a a little bit more time to do it. Do I wish that I had turned off the layer masks beforehand? Yes, I do. Am I going to turn them off now? Yes, I am. And it might be a good idea as well just to lock up the dog body before I come in and make any, any little changes here. But that's looking, that's looking all right anyway. So what do we do next? Do we go along and track the head just like we did the body? Well, we could do. That's certainly an option. But why duplicate work when you've already got a perfectly good track going on on the body? There's not a lot of movement going on on the body. So there's a bit more movement on the head here. But with the body track, we've already taken out the camera movement. So why don't we just recycle that, save ourselves a bit of time. Okay, let's set this up. Let's go to our layer controls. Go uh, call this layer dog head M. And I'm going to come down to my layer properties and have a look at this linked track. Remember when we were doing unlinked tracking, we set this to none. Well, let's now link our dog head to our dog body. And immediately, as soon as I've done that, you can see that our timeline has turned blue, which means that we've got a track associated with this layer. And if we've done anything with the adjust track, we can also link that to the adjusted track if we have to. But because we haven't adjusted anything, that's all perfectly fine. Let's come up here, make sure that our quick stabilizer is still turned on. And let's play that back. Cool. So now you can see we don't have to worry about the movement of the camera anymore. All we have to worry about is the slight movement of the dog and the dog's head. Just tweak that bit by his ear there. And we move through. I'm going to set a keyframe just before he starts moving which is around about there, add a keyframe onto that. And then as he's moving along, find where he stops moving, which is there. And now I can finally use my transform tool in the way that it was meant to be used. So the transform tool lets us transform an entire shape. Instead of going through and adjusting one or more control points individually, which runs the risk of starting to lose cohesion within the shape, and we start to see our mats wobbling about a little bit and, and bubbling, by using the transform tool, 
we can instead transform this entire shape at once. So if we select any of these corner points, we can be scaling the X and the Y. And if we hold down the shift, we can constrain proportions. Undo that. If we do the points in the middle, we can either we can scale either vertically or horizontally. And if we have our cursor around near a corner, but not actually on a corner, we can rotate the shape around. If you don't want to use the transform box, we can use the individual tools to rotate, scale, and translate. But the transform box is usually the easiest way of doing things. Now, so far, none of the transforms have given me the type of, uh, of movement that the dog's done. So he's moved his head to the side, so it's sort of warping around a little bit. Now, if I hold down the control key or command key on the Mac, I can do a distort on the corners. And this will sort of do a, well, it's, it's almost like doing a four corner pin because that's essentially what the distortion's doing to get our shape into the right position. And by doing it this way, it helps to maintain the correct sort of movement that we're seeing. If we do need to come in and do any individual points afterwards, then we can do that. But I always try to start working big and then work your way down to the smaller bits later on because that's going to give you the most consistent result. All right, let's turn our layer mats back on now. Turn our overlays off, zoom out, and play that through. And we can turn the quick stabilize off as well. I'll turn my motorbike back on. Cool, all right. And we've got the shape sort of working now. Let's come back to this one here for a second. Take a look at the edges here and come to our edge properties. What we can do with these, if I uh, change the dog body here, I'm going to make some big changes. So I'm going to turn, turn UbiKey on so that everything gets changed across the entire spline. What I can do with my edge width, so I can set my edge width in pixels. And what that's going to do is it's just going to soften that out for me. Set that to one. And that'll just soften that out a little bit. And if I need to add stuff to that, make that big, we can go plus, And that adds a big amount of softness. Undo that again. There we go. And undo that twice so that we've, we're back to our unsoftened edge. And I'll turn the RGB off as well so we can just see the mats only. And let's turn the edge width back up again and hit plus on that. You can see just how soft that edge is. And if you are wanting to work with per point edge softness, if I turn the overlays back on again, we've got two outlines. We've got the inner one, which is our hard edge, and then going out to the blue, which is our soft edge. So the softness goes from the inner to the edge. Now, when it comes to edge softness, we don't have to have a universal edge softness around the whole of our shape. If I come up to the top toolbar and go to the white tool that currently says B and click and hold on that, we can now select what we're looking at. We've got pick both, which means that when we move one point, we move both the edge and the inner. Or we can just go pick edge. If I come here now, and just be moving the edge around independently, or I can just pick the inner, which means that I can't do anything with the edge. I can only be working on the inner, undo that, and I can pick any as well, which means that depending on what I pick is the one that I'm playing around with. So we can move edge and inner independently. Do that to be. Take my edge width back, select all, and select my edge width back down to zero for everything. And select all was Control A or Command A on Mac. If you've got a lot of motion on your image and you want to put motion blur on the mask as well, then we can do that just by turning on motion blur in the edge properties. And we can change the angle, the phase, and the quality. Now you can't actually see the motion blur in this particular view on the selected layer view. We have to go to the mat for dog body, and I'll turn off my overlays one more time. And that will show us the mask with the motion blur. 
Let's save that out. I'm also going to export this because I want to show you something else as well. And just exit this out. As you can see, our host is uh, Adobe Premiere. Now, if I come to the Mocha plugin and open up Matt, I can view my Matt and that will render it out as a black and white image. And of course, I apply that Matt as well. And I can choose what layers um, I'm going to be looking at. I can look at all visible or all. And the all visible, where we can decide what layers are visible, either in the plugin itself, or if we want to go back into the plugin, we can just click on visible layers and then decide, okay, I only want to see the, the dog on this. So select just the dogs, turn that off, and say goodbye to the motorcycle. Then I can come in and add a bit of a feather on this. So that's a big one. That's a big one. Usually only one little bit. Maybe just a little feather would do absolutely fine. I can also invert it as well to cut that out and stick a color behind it. Beautiful. And without motion blur turned on, this renders out rather fast. So that's using it as a plugin in Premiere. If we come into After Effects, we have a few more options as well. So here we are in After Effects, exactly the same footage. Let's apply Mocha Pro plugin, come in here, and just merge that project. Make sure that everything's still fitting how it should do. It is great. Let's save that and exit, not do anything else. Because if we're working with the Mocha Pro plugin in After Effects, not only do we have the ability to do exactly the same as we did previously, so view the map, apply the map, all the visible layers, all of that stuff, what we can also do is we can create After Effects masks directly from the shapes that we had in Mocha. Now we have a little look down here. Yep, those are our masks, Motorcycle Bezier, Dog Body M, Dog Head M. Once we've got those in there, we can use After Effects built-in motion blur by turning motion blur on, on the layer and on here. And that will add After Effects' is native motion blur into here. And of course, we can always come in and feather this stuff out because we can treat them just as regular shapes. Another way of using the shape data, we just pop back into Mocha for a second. Yeah, another way of using this shape data is to export the shape data out of the Mocha interface. And we can do this whether we're working on the plugin version or the standalone version or Mocha AE. And what that does, it lets us choose a format for our shapes. And certain formats are not available depending on which version of Mocha you're working on. But we can take these out as um, Adobe Premiere shape data. So we can use these directly on effects. All of the usual suspects, you know, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, Blackmagic Fusion, Flame, Mocha Blend, if you're using the Mocha Blend plugin in Cinema 4D. Lots of different flavors of shapes for Nuke. So you'll probably want the later Roto or Roto Paint ones here. Gives you a bit more flexibility. But in our case, we're just going to export these as shape data for After Effects. And we can export selected layers, visible layers, or all layers. And copy that to the clipboard. Exit this out. We'll save on that. Come to our first frame. And instead of going paste here, we're going to come down to the bottom and go paste Mocha Mask. And just as we did when we did the Create AE Masks in the Mocha Pro plugin, this gives us those shapes as native After Effects mask. And that's going to be it for our rotoscoping basics. So we've looked at the different types of splines that we can use and how the X spline and the Bezier spline differ from each other. We've seen how we can start to set the viewer up a little bit more for checking the roto splines as we're making them. And we've seen a couple of different workflows for how we can work with animated roto splines. So where we have the initial track that locks everything down and then we can change the splines on that same layer or where we can take a new layer and link that to our already tracked data to make our rotoscoping a lot easier. And really we've just scratched the surface on that, but that should be enough to get you started down your rotoscoping journey with Mocha. And coming up in the next exercise, we're gonna be looking at a more complicated insert, this time using the insert module 
and the features that that provides us. So join me in exercise nine.